Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in today's video, we're talking about the idea of carbon sequestration in our garden. Regardless of what side of the climate change debate you're on, there is the potential for soil to control CO2. So I'll throw up a graph of what the CO2 has looked like over the past you know, 4,000, 5,000 years. I'll see what I can come up with. But essentially what it shows is spikes in CO2 with an immediate dry off or uh, cool cooling effect. So I think with the CO2 levels and what they naturally do without human intervention is scary because the reality is, is that as CO2 increases, regardless of the reason for it, the world tends to get warmer and then it goes into an absolute flash freeze. We like to call the ice age and that's kind of what's triggered all the ice ages throughout humanity. And us here right now as humans, homo, homo sapiens, or is it homo sapiens sapien, whatever it is, we haven't experienced this yet. We haven't experienced an, uh, an ice age in recorded history. We only know this from ice cores that we've we've taken over time. So regardless of what side you're on, the reality is that you want to control CO2 because if you can bring the CO2 down, you ultimately can control the environment. So we humans are really good at manipulating the world around us and making the world around us suit us perfectly. And so using the soil as a way to engineer our world, think of terraforming, but in like a, a earth sense, this is the solution. It, it does come down to soil. And I might be biased because I am a soil scientist. So we're gonna look at what sequesters CO2 and uh, kind of how to keep CO2 in our system. From there, I'm going to teach you in the next video how to actually calculate how much carbon you've sequestered in your soil, maybe whether or not you've hit maximum capacity, because there is a maximum capacity you can hit, and kind of all that fun stuff in between. So there are two main ways in which carbon is sequestered into the soil. The first way being through the plant. So plants take up CO2 through our stomata, and we talked about this in our 17 essential nutrients video, where I talked about carbon as one of the 17 essential nutrients. So as that stomata opens up and allows CO2 in, ultimately what happens is 40%, which is like a mind blowing number to me. It's just crazy every time I hear of that. But 40% of all the carbohydrates or the complex carbs that they do develop inside of the plant are actually distributed to the roots and they're released as something we call exudates. So exudates are kind of like the McDonald's meal, Subway, KFC, a smorgasbord of different food. And the microbes that prefer KFC over McDonald's is what ultimately chooses to move into the area. But the plant is smart. The plant knows what nutrient needs at what times. So if the plant is in a foliage stage versus a flowering stage, it may call out for more nitrogen solubilizing or nitrogen nitrifying bacteria over and beyond something like a phosphate solubilizing bacteria that it may call for in the flowering period. So say that nitrifying bacteria really likes the taste of McDonald's. The exudate released is going to taste like McDonald's, whereas the exudate released for phosphate solubilizing bacteria may taste like KFC. It's kind of what the plant does. But those exudates are made from carbon. So once they go into the soil, they don't come back out. So 40% of all the CO2 uptake that plants have goes directly back into the soil. So it's literally like a sieve that's literally capturing carbon and putting it back into our soil system. So that's no way number one. The second way is through fungi. And this is really starting to pick up in the industry, whether it's through cannabis or through gardening, even houseplants are starting to pick this up. ProMix really brought this to the forefront of the gardening community through their um, HP inoculated mycorrhizae formula that they developed and they did a whole video on that formula. But essentially what it comes down to is endo and acto mycorrhizae and their interactions with the plants. So as those hyphae tend to swell, they need carbon to build them up. And so all the hyphae in our soil is built from carbon. 
So for hyphae to expand, which it will expand, and it will interconnect every single plant in its area together and make one massive mind, uh, uses carbon. And so that's another way in which carbon is sequestered into the soil. So one of the biggest pieces of hyphal, mycorrhizal, fungi documented is somewhere in the US. I can't remember exactly where. It's the size of a football field. They can't pinpoint how old it is. It's between 2,000 and 7,000 years old, but it's just one single hyphae in that whole area. And it's responsible for literally sequestering tens of tons, like a, literally a shitload of carbon. So you're probably thinking, well, my yard, what's my yard really going to do for carbon sequestration? And the reality is that your yard alone, if it's 2.5 ish acres or one hectare, it's on the low end on the low end where you're doing nothing in particular or special is capable of sequestering up to 10 tons of carbon in a year. Now, obviously those are in areas that maybe don't have uh, heavy winters like we do here in Canada, but ultimately 10 tons a year is incredibly high. If you treat your soil right, especially in areas where you have a growing season that lasts the entire year, California, I'm talking to you, you can sequester up to 20 tons of carbon dependent on your soil type. Trudeau, Ponia. So uh, all jokes aside, there has been studies done. Uh, one was done out of, I believe it was the University of Colorado in their agriculture department. And uh, no, sorry, it was Noah. I have Noah written down here. Noah uh, said that if we changed our practices in farming, all that fun stuff, um, gardening, land management, we could actually bring our CO2 levels down to a really nice level. And I mean, us here in Northern Canada are like, let them keep going up because we want that heat. But ultimately we could reverse our CO2 levels within 10 to 15 years with a global imp implementation. So uh, us here in Canada are like, no, let them go up because it's really cold. But uh, the reality is that we're great at changing the world around us. And it's, it's a way to change the CO2 in our world. Regardless of what side of the argument you're on, you want to control CO2 because it's always in an upward cycle. It's very, very cyclical naturally without human intervention. And we want to control that. We're human. We want to control that. Trust me. So uh, one thing to note, though, and one thing I do have written down here that I did want to stress quite heavily was the fact that your soil type will alter how much carbon can be sequestrated. So a sandy soil has a lower ability to sequestrate carbon and it will get full faster than that of maybe a clay soil. Grasslands are really good at sequestrating soil or sequestrating carbon compared to that of maybe a forest. So where you are is going to kind of, it's gonna determine uh, what your ability is to sequestrate, right? Something to keep in mind. So the next question is, how do we do this? How do we sequestrate carbon in our soil and make this work to our benefit? And why would you want to sequestrate soil in maybe your lawn or your garden or whatever the case is? And the reality is that even if you don't do this for environmental reasons, if you want better nutrient cycling, if you want better soil structure in the case of a sandy soil, or a heavy clay soil, the two very opposite ends of the spectrum, or if you want high yield, really green grass, all that stuff, you actually do want a substantial amount of carbon in your soil. You want your soil doing majority of the work for you. So some things that carbon can do is increase cation exchange capacity, alter the way nutrient is cycle, nutrients is cycled, and the reason for that is through the microbiota that ends up just naturally occurring in carbon uh, high soils. Uh, the next one is toxin absorption. So your cation exchange capacity increases, your anion exchange capacity actually increases in the case of high carbon soils. And then you also end up with toxin absorption just by chance, just by chance of 
what's going on there. So for that's for the chemical side. For the physical side of things, you end up with bigger, uh, better structure, more flocculation, chelation, all that fun stuff. Um, there's also quite a bit of science to indicate uh, increase in water holding capacity. Now that may not be necessarily the fault of the carbon in the microbiota so much as it, or the bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, but it's more so the fault of the hyphae, the fungal hyphae that helps actually sequester or hold more water in the system rather than letting it run down to groundwater or letting it run off kind of the surface, right? So, and then for the biological side, we end up with more microbial activity, so nutrient cycling, all that fun stuff. And then we actually end up with more disease suppression in the form of fungal, bacterial, uh, pests, all that stuff, because again, microbiota when it's out of balance you'll know because you'll end up with increased rates of things such as powdery mildew for example that can overwinter in our foliage if we don't have enough bugs that are willing to eat the foliage and conversely eat the spores that come with powdery mildew we end up with an imbalance and then ta-da it ends up on our cucumbers and squash and all that fun stuff. So, so the ways to increase this comes down to things like crop rotation. Crop rotation is important because it helps support the rhizosphere in the plant, those enzymes, those exudates that we're talking about being released, but ultimately also we end up with different types of plants. So for example, if we plant a legume in an area, that's peas, beans, anything in the nitrogen fixing family, we end up with nitrogen fixing bacteria, rhizobium bacteria is what we call it. And uh, that will sequester in the soil. It'll nitrogen fix N2 gas from the atmosphere, pull it into our soil. The next year, if we plant a heavy feeder, such as corn, for example, in that area, we end up with really great results because we have an excess of nitrogen that has been pulled out of the atmosphere without any fertilizer and placed in the soil. And I think I've repeated this quite a few times, but if you are getting, uh, doing peas, beans, um, like scarlet runners, like anything in the legume family, then check out this stuff here. This is that rhizobacteria. So you wanna grab that if possible. Other ways to increase this is using the lactobacillus. So I did a blog post. I think there's a free printable for that. And then I think I also did a video on it too, where I discussed how to make lactobacillus using white rice. And if you use that, you will have increased rates of decomposition. So if you're using compost or manures in your potting soil, like indoor house plants, or if you're using it outdoors, using a lactobacillus inoculant on that soil surface is going to help to with the decomposition process and ultimately just the nutrient cycling in general. So that is something we can also, also add to the system. You can use inoculants, so the mycorrhizal inoculants. I'm going to get that Dymaco stuff and run some tests with that. I'll let you guys know how that turns out. But uh, whenever you're looking for a mycorrhizal fungi, you want to aim for something that is either broad spectrum, has multiple different forms of or species of mycorrhizal fungi, and is a combination of ecto and endo mycorrhizal fungi. So you kind of want a combination of all of them. I found one product that I was really interested in getting, and then I bought it, and it was coming over the border, but then the Canadian Border Services said no. So, and it was like a, I'll post what it is here. I can leave the link for it down below, but I don't know if it works or not, but it was like bacteria, mycorrhizae, it had a whole host. It was a really, really nice product that I really wanted to get my hands on, but unfortunately it's not for sale in Canada. So we have very stringent old rules there. So um, another way to increase microbial activity is through the additions of compost and manures or live animals. So if you, there is um, wild, wild edibles on the channel, she raises rabbits that are super cute if you ever wanna check it out. But um, even if you could, like if you have a lawn, if you have a way of getting rabbits on it, I mean, you're gonna see some really, really good results. But if you don't have access to livestock, then you would want to do a mix. So of 
compost and manure. And don't do the same thing every year. So people always ask me which one's better, sheep or bat guano or uh, cow manure. Like you always ask me that. And the answer is all of them. Every single one has a different set of microbes in it. So you should be rotating out the types you're using. One year use cow, next year use sheep. The year after that you swine. Like it does literally does not matter what you use. Just try different stuff. Same with compost. If you're doing leaf mold one year, good. Do regular vegetable compost the next. Do mushroom compost the year after that. Do vera compost the year after that. Really rotate through all of it because each one's gonna have a different profile of nutrients. Each one's gonna have a different profile of microbiota. And you want to increase the, just the microbe activity to really help your plants out and really help that rise of sphere down below. So, but that's all I have for this video here today. Next video, I'm going to show you guys how to figure out what your carbon content in your soil is. The next video does not apply to the houseplant people. Unfortunately, because you guys are soilless medium, I cannot help you determine what your carbon content is because the whole freaking thing is carbon content, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but for those using any sort of soil, actual soil, I'll be able to help you out with that. So if you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. Let me know in the comments down below what you do to sequester carbon, uh, tips and tricks that you use. And I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.